I was going to say, so building the business case for the private cloud, if that's, uh, if that's not what you want to hear about, you're in the wrong place. But please stay anyway, because uh, I'd like to have your uh, participation. So welcome, and thanks for your dedication to uh, join the session right after lunch. Uh, I, I can tell from the noise outside that not all of your colleagues are uh, as dedicated as you. So I appreciate you coming to the session right after the lunch, uh, the lunch break. Uh, I'm Doug Bourgeois, I'm Vice President and Chief Cloud Executive with VMware's US, U.S. Public Sector Division. Uh, in my role, um, I basically provide um, consultative executive advice to multiple organizations about cloud computing, cloud computing strategies, um, value proposition, um, pitfalls, and so on and so forth. So I spend roughly half my time on the federal side and in the last year, now spending about half my time with state government and local government and, and higher education uh, for the most part. So before we, uh, we dive in, there's a question I'd like to ask you guys to help me out so I understand um, how I can provide the best value to you, which is uh, we're here to talk about business case for the private cloud. What is it about the business case that would be most valuable to you? What do you really want to hear about? If there was one thing that you got out of this discussion, because I hope it's a discussion, and that you walk out the door and say, darn, that was valuable, what would it be? Unexpected costs. Unexpected costs. Love it. What, what is the cost parameter? Per seat, per user parameter? That one's a little trickier. So if I don't get to who asked the per seat, uh, come back to me later on and ask me again, because it, it really depends on what service you know, you're offering. So I got three good ones here. Uh, any others? Uh, public sector specific security and compliance uh, consideration. Yeah. When I get to my second example, if I don't hit on compliance, ask me because that's where it fits really well. If, if you have a hybrid environment, is there additional cost versus the, you know, having it all in now I'm wishing I had a great slide on the cost of private cloud, public cloud, and hybrid cloud, and I wish I had put it in. But for the, for the sake of time, I took it out. So uh, I hope to hit on that as well. Is there additional cost for the hybrid? I have to stop there because I'm running out of space on this paper here. So let's see. Uh, please ask me questions along the way, though. Um, so from an agenda perspective, I'm going to try and cover background and some context pretty quickly, um, but I want to level set everybody on a couple of things before I go into it. And then I'm going to cover basically two examples. And the only reason I'm using federal examples is because one, the first one, uh, Department of the Interior's National Business Center, um, that was mine. I was the executive in charge of that agency, and it happened on my watch, so I know a lot about it. Um, the second one, the Department of Energy National Nuclear Security Administration, I just happened to be kind of the chief advisor to them. So I was, I've been heavily involved for the last three years on, on that initiative, so I can, I can talk about that. And then I'm going to close with some additional thoughts on kind of where cloud is going and what the, I wouldn't call it the final state, but a target state a few years down the road might, might look like. So again, thanks and uh, welcome. I really appreciate you coming. One quick piece of background um, just to kind of help um, flavor the conversation. Uh, in terms of my background, um, I spent 10 years as an executive in the federal government in only two jobs in, in 10 years. I was the CIO at the United States Patent and Trademark Office for almost four years. Uh, and then I ran the Department of the Interior's National Business Center, which was a centralized shared services operation to provide services to other federal agencies on a full cost recovery basis. So m much like a service provider, um, but we had to fully recoup our cost, and that was in IT, payroll, HR, accounting, finance, contracting, and so on and so forth. So it's a pretty broad array of services. Now I've been with VMware for three years in this role. I've already kind of described you know, that role and what I've been doing uh, in that. Uh, one quick piece on VMware, just in case you don't know who we are, is we basically started in virtualization, which is, as we were having a conversation before we even started, is the foundation for cloud computing. It's a very important underlying capability. Um, and we invented that technology on the x86 market um, about 15 or so years ago and, and ca basically captured the largest piece of that market. Still have somewhere between 80 and 84 percent of all x86 servers that are virtualized or run in VMware. Depends on whose data. That would be Gartner Group's data, basically. But this year, just announced yesterday, we're up to 
$4.6 billion company in 2012, and we believe it will, will, will surpass $5 billion in, in 2013. Um, so some quick uh, level set on some trends, right? So delivery methods are changing because of cloud computing. Devices, people are using different types of devices to access their work environment. They're accessing applications in different ways, and their work and lifestyle is very mobile, and it's, it's kind of changed quite dramatically over the last several years. And so those are the underpinnings that are allowing this, these big, what I call the big five trends. You could argue on the periphery of a different trend or whatnot, but I see you know, software-defined data center, which is a synonymous for the private cloud. Um, the hybrid clouds and brokers, which is kind of, you know, most organizations, when they get to their private cloud, they then want to do a hybrid cloud. So that generally comes next. Not necessarily the case, but generally speaking. Uh, Multi-device mobility. Uh, big data. Can't go anywhere these days without talking about big data and analytics and more and more um, volumes of data and faster response times and so on and so forth. And then what I call the application ecosystem, and it's um, a little bit more of a nuance, but is with multiple device access on the one end and cloud infrastructure on the other end, what gets squeezed in the middle is the applications. And so there's a, a, a movement afoot to migrate applications to be able to work in that, that middle layer of that, um, that stack that I, that I just described. You can also call it platform as a service, PaaS, which is a cloud computing um, model. So first I found, and it's a little bit disappointing, but I do still need to level set on what exactly is cloud computing. And I think we can blame those of us in industry for that, um, is that we tend to you know, call everything cloud nowadays. Um, but just to level set, you know, pooled services in a multi-tenant environment, but that multi-tenant can still be one organization, right? It could be the HR department and the finance department. I mean, it could be you know, other department organizations, but it's a multi-tenant shared environment. Consumption-based, so the customers pay for only that which they use, kind of like a utility company model. Um, it's elastic, and this tends to be the trickiest from a technology standpoint. Customers can grab the resources they need when they need them, but they can release them when they no longer need them. And it's, you know, in terms of IT industry, we've spent the last, actually, the entire years of technology figuring out how to scale up, right? Customers always ask, how efficiently do you scale? How quickly do you scale? What is your model for how you scale? And now we're having to say, well, we can actually scale down too, right? Scaling up, we, we've mastered scaling down a little bit trickier. And then also ubiquitous network access. Generally, uh, folks think about the internet, but that's not necessarily the case. So that said, the, the journey to the cloud generally happens in three phases. The first phase is really um, the opportunity for the IT organization to, to test it out and show what they can do with things that are in their control. So it tends to be the applications and services that IT has total control over. And they you know, kind of start in that area. And then uh, as they become more familiar and build up a, an environment which is conducive uh, to the cloud model, they tend to go to more mission critical types of applications uh, database applications and other uh, larger transactional kind of applications and others. Um, and then phase three becomes much more of a transitioning to a true IT as a service business model that's very um, agile and provides end users with the ability to make changes on an ongoing basis and it's optimized. So um, to paraphrase these three phases, the first phase is mostly concerned with consolidation. And there's a lot of dollar savings that you know, can happen there. That's why we're talking about the business case here. The second phase tends to be more around automation, and that's, you know, leveraging the technology to carry out activities and tasks in a much more rapid fashion, and I'll talk some more about that from a business case standpoint here in a minute. And then the third stage is really that optimization, and that's where there's, you know, multi-clouds connected, and then it's like decisions strategically are made about what workloads do we put in these various clouds um, for various reasons and, and how are we going to operate them and how are we going to manage and, and support them. All right, so uh, why develop a business case in the first place? Uh, who cares, right? You know, so um, I'd be interested to know your feedback on this. This is a, a Gartner, from a Gartner uh, survey where they asked, you know, what are the three biggest challenges that you faced in creating your cloud computing service? And um, notice, you know, notice the majority of the responses, right? Management and operational processes, you know, need to change, right? So there's some challenge in, in that. Um, figuring out the funding and chargeback model, right? So how am I going to do that? 
you know, how far do I go with it? What does my model look like? How do I implement that? Um, the culture, right? I don't know about you folks and your customers. I always found that most of my customers were server huggers, right? They, they were paying for something and they wanted to feel it. And they wanted to know it was there. And now when it's virtual, it's kind of like, well, what exactly am I paying for? You know, I can't touch it, I can't feel it. So it's, it's very difficult for them to make that, that transition. Um, the service description and self-service interface. Um, this is one of the areas, I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but this is one of the areas that, that I found is a potential gotcha, right? We had one of the unexpected costs. Uh, you know, that's one that tends to either be a, uh, an unexpected cost that folks didn't anticipate or, or one that the cost ends up being higher than they originally budgeted for. So that tends to, you know, take away from the potential business case. And then politics is, you know, a lot of times uh, decisions are made for reasons and in the organization for uh, other than that the business case is, um, is solid here. Um, thoughts on this? Yeah. Um, do you list under politics, for example, the um, uh, inability to make a long strategy for starting with something small and scaling it or justifying the costs initially? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Politics is vague, you know, and what is politics? It's different in, di in each organization. And it comes in forms like, okay, politics, um, we're going to consolidate to this organization because that's the way it's going to be. And then, you know, the other end of the spectrum is this really no game plan whatsoever, right? So you see it all in the world of politics. And that tends to make, I don't want to use the word, the wrong word, but rational, logical, analytical decision making a little more challenging, right, to do that. So I'm criticizing myself there as the person who used to run the agency. So. You can call it culture too, right? I mean, they're very similar things, but you know, culture also has to do with the, the challenge of changing from this state to that state. Is that you know the the inertia of the current, and it could be everything from the expertise of the team that is used to using a certain technology, and it you know, and it's not going to be the technology for the the future state to. The, the training challenges, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of different things there. So last piece from a big picture standpoint is um, one of the most important lessons that I've learned about the business case for cloud and, and justifying it in the government context is why does the citizen care? You know, why does the end user of your service, if it's employees, care? So if the, if the discussion around cloud is technical, from a business case standpoint, is it you're kind of missing the point, right? Because ultimately, it's the end users or it's the citizens who are using the government services who are really going to determine whether the, the business case is real or not. So one of the things that, that we like to talk about is that there's um, cloud computing enables a digital government approach, which includes, right, it has to have that underlying infrastructure to be efficient but also agile, to be able to be, you know, like I said, elastic and automated to create new services in a much more efficient fashion. Um, there needs to be access to the right applications for that citizens care about and end users care about, and they need to be accessing them with the device that, you know, that they need in order to be productive on the job. And you look at it, and a lot of folks, particularly in the federal space, look at me and say, well, why do employees need mobile devices? And you think about it, it's like, right, caseworkers in the field, right, law enforcement. I mean, you, you can go through tons of numbers of examples of federal occupations. I had aviation inspectors on my team. They have to go where the airplanes are, right? I mean, you just go through all of this. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward, is they have to be there um, in a lot of cases. And it's not, people tend to think of office workers, you know, that the government employees are sitting in offices and pounding on desktops. And there's a certain amount of employees that that's the nature of the work, but certainly not in every case, right? And we need to be able to enable them to be productive. I guess more productive than maybe they, they have been in the past. So the example, the first example I'm gonna go t through is the organization that I ran um, from 2004 to 2010. And um, this is just to give you a feel for what we did and what our scale were, was. I mentioned those services before, but roughly around $400 million a year. So what I would call a mid-sized you know, organization in terms of you know, comparing to the Fortune 1000 or something, something like that. And what we did was we built, my team built the first enterprise class community cloud for the federal government in about 2008. 
and into 2009. So that was you know roughly four or five years ago um, when that um, cloud was was stood up and moved into production. And so again, lesson number one: establish the strategic context for the cloud. Now, fortunately, I was running the agency and I had some vision. And so I was tying it to our mission, right? Our mission was to provide quality services and efficient solutions for our end users. So the business case started with why are we trying to do it? Tying it to something that the people who have to approve the business case actually care about. Now they do care about money, efficiency, right? They do care about money and these days it, it, it's maybe even more important in terms of the main drivers for a business case than maybe it used to be with everybody under so many budget constraints. But that's not everything, right? Uh, especially in the government where you have constituencies involved and a lot of people in the decision-making process that they need to be convinced that it's going to add some value other than, than just the money piece. Lesson number two, establish the scope and the roadmap. Ultimately, a business case is a function of what your current environment looks like, what you want that target environment to be and how you're going to get there. So it has to be defined to some degree. Uh, otherwise, um, you're going to be surprised by a lot of things. So in our case, what we decided to do was to plan for three different releases. Right? So the first release at the infrastructure level was going to be basically a standard environment for, for dev test users. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Um, the next one was going to be standard blocks for production and then, and then a second piece to add on to the dev test environment to let it be more configurable. And then the third was going to be adding in high security, basically. Then we also said, okay, we're going to do some platform stuff too. So release one was basic, a basic LAMP stack available in our cloud environment. Then the next release was adding what I called lifecycle development. You know, all of the you know, check-in, check-out processes for the source code and the, and the tools and services that all of the, the complete development team needed, um, project management tools and all that to be available in the cloud. And then the last piece, which by the way, um, that's, that's one that we didn't get to before I left the organization, which was self-service deployment to an app store. We never, we never got to that piece. But everything I've mentioned so far did actually get done. And then the last piece was at the software level, uh, starting with commodity applications that everybody used, going into shared applications, and then eventually mission applications. And in this stack, all we got to was the first one. Okay, so if that makes sense. So, so we got the entire infrastructure row done. We got two out of the three in the platform level, and we got one on the software level. So we basically took, it's kind of hard, to, a diagonal line. First release was the one on the bottom left, and then we did two, and then we did the three, if that makes sense. So again, we need to know the scope because that's going to determine your cost structure. But then we had all these other things that came up along the way. What was our service going to be specifically for the end user? What was our support model 24-7 from a help desk standpoint or something less than that? What does our pricing model look like? What was our contract arrangement going to be with our end user customers? There were other federal agencies, but how would we be contractually obligated to meet their needs and what would they be obligated to, to provide to us and some other organizational changes. All of these, what were our cycle times going to be for our service offering? All of these things came into the equation as we were building our, our service offering. Uh, let me go to, let me talk about it here for a second. So uh, from a cycle time standpoint, for example, um, one of the things that we decided on, and it was very difficult to make this decision, nowadays it's a lot easier because we're talking about four or five years ago, was um, how, how quickly did we want our customers to be able to provision their environment automatically without our IT touching the environment? Did we want to let them build, you know, automatically create a virtual machine in a matter of minutes? A matter of days, a matter of weeks, what did we want to do? So we drew the line at four hours. And we said that was, at that point in time, that was such a substantial improvement from the six months that it took in the physical world that, that they would be happy about that. And we were right, right? We went from six months to four hours. And we guaranteed, by the way, in our service level agreement, we guaranteed no more than four hours. Nowadays, we're seeing you know, five minutes, right? I mean, things have evolved quite a bit. Um, but that was a big step for us because we made that a contractual commitment from a cycle time standpoint. So de actually defining the solution. And the reason I point this out is I see a lot of customers talking about you know, the virtual stack 
and you know the fulfillment capability of that, the automation piece I was just describing. Um, not everybody is thinking about integrating into their service management module. Not everybody is thinking about, do I have an account? Am I treating my customers like their accounts? Because ultimately, you're going to bill them for the services that they use. It, and that could be a substantial change from the way the IT department is operating before the cloud is built. So you know, did you need to build that account management piece, or did you need to integrate it into the billing and collection system? Um, do you build a customer portal so that the customer can do their own self-service, and you can, do, you can control exactly how the workflow works, or do you leverage now some of the capabilities in off-the-shelf software to do that? So um, at the time, we had to build that ourselves, the customer portal. And that was a huge, I, I wouldn't say money sink, but it cost a lot of money to custom develop that, and ultimately, we were getting into the software business in order to do that. Nowadays. There's a lot of uh, off-the-shelf products that can, that can do, that, do that for you, so you don't need to, to customize that. So again, so what is exactly the scope in, in, uh, of the solution, which is driven by what is the service model that you're, that you're implementing? And so security was, was brought up as a, as a question folks wanted to talk about. And so one of the lessons that we learned was, you know, look for cloud solution that has a plug-and-play approach with security. In other words, you don't want to have to create an entirely new security model for your cloud. You want it to plug into and interface with as much of your existing security tools as possible. And that means, you know, API-based approach for integrating into, uh, integrating the tools with the cloud solution. And in, this, is, this is actually a slide from uh, a presentation that I use, I didn't change a, a thing. Uh, in 2008, when I was going to my customers and selling the cloud concept to my government customers. So this is exactly the same slide, and what I was talking about was, you know, in those days we had three physical zone um, zones, right? So we had the, the depth test, low security, we had the moderate security for sensitive but unclassified, and we had the high security. And those were physically separate environments, but within the environment, uh, all customers were sharing the infrastructure. Okay? Nowadays, that's not necessary, right? All of the environments can share the physical infrastructure and you can use the cloud capabilities to, to do the logical separation and the virtual security to separate and so on and so forth. So you can have virtual zone isolation. So, so it's more efficient to do it now than it was, was when we did that. Continuous monitoring, again, how are the, con the continuous monitoring tools that you probably already have in place going to interface with the operations tools and be able to... Um, uh, to basically plug into that process so that that business process doesn't change. Uh, enterprise access control is a very important aspect to think about is what is the identity management and access control model for this cloud. And when you think about the, the state where some employees might be accessing applications that might be Salesforce kind of applications, you might have outsourced HR applications that they're using, are you going to use a single sign-on for your entire cloud scenario? We built it ourselves, right? We built what we called our federated identity management solution in that. Nowadays, again, don't need to do that. There's products available that can do that and plug into your enterprise directory services. So you need to think about, are we going to build this ourselves to implement that architecture, or are we going to plug into something that exists already, which is going to ultimately be, be more efficient? Somebody had a question on security. Did, did we cover it, or is it a deeper question than that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, I'll talk about it now from what I know about what customers are doing, and this, this is getting into the second example a little bit, but it, it, now the tools exist both at the cloud level and at the configuration management level, right, so more operational, to um, use, I don't know if you're familiar with, you know, with the, the terminology, a virtual data center. Okay, which is, which is uh, um, the, the ability to stand up that um, multiple VM environment with the boundaries around it for a particular organization. They have control over that virtual data center. This other customer has control of their own virtual data center, and so those are separate, but they're sharing the underlying physical infrastructure. That virtual data center can be configured from an IT standpoint to be compliant with a particular 
HIPAA, FISMA, FedRAMP, whatever you want it to be, yeah. And so, so that's one piece, which is you know, setting up that environment so that it complies with that. And that's a combination of using the templates, you know, the configuration where you, you know what those templates are and what they're going to instantiate when they're triggered, and then the audit process and the review that happens when it's actually physically implemented initially so that you pass the, the initial audit test. But then there's the ability to use the configuration management tools like the National Nuclear Security Administration does. So what they do is they, they're using, um, they've got their virtual data center and it's compliant to their security regulations, which we'll call them FISMA, but it's really not, they have their own. So what they're doing is on a sub-second basis, they're comparing that production environment to the approved security baseline using configuration management automation. Uh, we call it policy-driven automation. So, so when that environment in production becomes out of compliance with the baseline, what they do is they use the cloud tool set to automatically stand up another virtual data center. They stand up the firewalls around it and they isolate it from everything else. They move that configuration into that virtual data center and they trigger the security incident response team to start carrying out their actions. They roll back the production version to the last known compliant version, and so the users never know that there's anything going on. They're not impacted. They're not kicked out, because that's what cloud virtualization and cloud computing can do for you now. They're able to continue to, to process the transactions and access the system just like they were. They don't know, but security knows, and now they've got an auto, we, they call it automatic quarantine, and they have the security team looking into and, and responding to what, what happened there. That particular implementation won a SANS Institute Security Award for innovation, I want to say two years ago now. And so these are things that you can do, not only to implement the compliant environment, but to make sure that it's maintained over time. Okay. Sure. Well, considering the organizational impacts, uh, and there are potentially um, minor impacts and potentially substantial impacts. It depends on what you're trying to do. Um, some existing roles like infrastructure administrator, even software developers and security architects, those roles are going to change some, but it depends on, on, on how you want to implement your cloud that's going to drive that. For example, in our security model, right, so anytime a new environment was stood up, the security team needed to review and approve the configuration of that before I could go into production, right? So what we did was we brought the security team in to the cloud project so that any template that was put into the cloud that could be accessed by any end user on a self-service basis was already security approved. So that when the customer is coming into their cloud, and it, it didn't matter which customer, and it didn't matter which virtual data center they were coming into, as long as they used a template that was already security approved, security did not need to get involved before that was moved into production. I still have some customers today that don't allow that. They don't need to go to that level of precaution. What you need to do is have the workflow set up so that if they make a change that then violates the compliance, then that workflow goes to security and security gets to take a look at it before it goes into production, right? So that's just an example of how roles might change. <laughs> There's actually other roles that come up. And I use this um, first, the library administrator, which is who's the control point on the, conf on the templates that are going into the cloud, they're going to be automated. Right? Somebody needs to own it, because if somebody doesn't own it, then anything's going to go in there. So there's a potential transition for people, there's a potential new role. If there's a new role, you might have to create you know, the HR, follow the HR process, right? create new position descriptions, interview people, you know, that sort of thing. Even though you might just be changing the, the, the role of existing staff, you need to still have some cost in that process. Now, service manager is a whole different ballgame. This is a part of a bigger transition to being a service provider as an organization. And when you get down to cloud and the capabilities that customers want in cloud, um, they are going to want to know everything about your service offering and your cost structure. They call it transparency. You might be familiar with this term, right? They all want everything to be transparent. So who is it in your organization who's going to spend a ton of time, probably all of their time, talking with customers on the front end before cloud services are built defining all of those pieces, showing them what the cost model is going to look like so that they, they build it into their budget plan so that they can pay you for what they actually use, right? And then they're going to call you when they get the bill. And they're going to say, what is this all about? I didn't use this much, right? So it is actually a new role that gets created and needs to be budgeted for. 
And this is a little different impact. This is more of the training piece, right? It's the end users, the knowledge work workers that are going to access the cloud, the task workers, power users, and even mobile device users, depending on what service you're offering through the cloud. Their roles are going to change too, and they're going to need to be trained. So my point is there's more than one organizational impact. You might have consolidation of roles. You know, and you might have a policy that says, you know, we don't actually lay off employees, we give them opportunities to do different things. That's fine, right? Whatever your policy is. Um, but you need to plan for that, because if you're not going to reduce the number of staff and you're going to change their jobs, you have, you're incurring cost for that transition that needs to be carefully planned for. And I'll give you a little anecdote as to why. So I mentioned that, that um, progression of our services. The first project we implemented was um, that dev test environment. That project was done in like 87 days, start to finish. No glitches whatsoever. Phase two was taking that to our uh, sensitive but unclassified production environment and building that uh, LAMP stack capability, right? So that was project number two. So project number two, the team gets going. It's a little bit bigger team this time, right? Because phase one was pretty simple. Phase two was a little bit bigger. So about a week into the project, I mean, we did it just like we did the first phase, right? We brought our project team together. We told them kind of what we were trying to do. What is our goals? What is our, you know, architecture going to look like? What are all the things we're doing? What's your role in all this? So about a week in, I was already back in D.C. This team was out in Denver, right? So I get the call from the CIO that worked for me, and she said, well, uh, we got a problem in the cloud project. I said, well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is the team's refusing to work. <laughs> Well, that's a problem, <laughs> right? Why do we have mutiny, you know, among, among the team? Well, uh, I don't know, but we need to, you need to get out here and find out. So I was on a plane the next day, and I went out to Denver, and I spent two days with the entire team. And basically what I heard in a two-day conversation was, um, I, I know my not, job's going to change. I'm not sure I'm going to have a job when this is done. Even if I do have a job, I'm pretty sure I don't know how to do it. And you're going to bring in these tools that I've never seen before. And then you're going to hold me accountable for not using them correctly. So you might lay me off because I didn't perform. So there was all this stuff built up in their heads when our intention, you know, we're just thinking like, we, we have a job to do here and we're all in it together. So we, you know, it becomes basic organizational change management. So, we, you know, you're now the training coordinator. You're going to define the training curriculum and, and, and assign people to those curriculums so that they know what training they're going to get and when as we go through this process. Right? That was just one, one example. Um, you can avoid all that, <laughs> is my point. But it does have cost. Um, lesson number six, process change is still change. This is an actual workflow of how we broke down the swim lanes for our existing operation with an automated solution here and the things that they were going to that they needed to be responsible for executing as a customer was basically coming in and creating a, a VM on the fly. Yeah. <laughs> you can have it. I think this, uh, we'll make this available. If not through the conference, we can certainly get you a copy. But the, the point is, and it kind of goes back to the training piece, right, is that the people's jobs, their tasks are going to change, and they need to know how on the front end, and they need to be trained appropriately. Otherwise, uh, you're, you're running some risk. So this is also an actual slide from, from what I was doing to try and bring customers onto the cloud once it was built. And what this shows, I picked this one for a reason, but this is basically for uh, an HR service um, where customers would come in and automatically instantiate a, a version of a training application and then be able to have access to it to carry out their training. So this was more of a SaaS type of an offering than an infrastructure offering. And what we did was we compared our, our old cost model to our new cost model on, the, on facilities, the hardware cost, the maintenance cost, software, and the labor associated with that. And then what I did was to, I, I put these ranges in to kind of give an idea of depending on your environment, you know, what, you know what's the best case going to be, what's the worst case going to be to give you an idea of kind of how, how things would, uh, would flow. But the point was, this is just like, this is the current state of operation before cloud. This was the state of operation after cloud. What I don't have here is the cost of transition. And that's going back to the question of the unexpected cost. So we had to incorporate. Then we added in before we went and told our customers, this is what we're going to charge you in the new world, is that we had to go in and say, OK, now we've got um, some training costs. We've got some transition pieces we've got to deal with. We have some new you know, uh, software that we need to build, and we, get to, we had to kind of pull it up. So the bottom line was this operation-to-operation -operation comparison was a 40% cost reduction. 
40% cost reduction. Now, what we did is we backed out half of that savings and we went and changed prices to customers and said, we'll save you 20% because it's going to cost us 20% to get there. Right? And that turned out to be, you know, essentially accurate. We, you know, we had to make some adjustments, but again, we had to fully recover our costs in order to, um, in order to um, offer that, that service. Questions about example one? Because now I'm going into example two. This is the national, okay, go ahead. Those, <clears throat> what we find sometimes when some executive attends a cloud-based or SaaS software uh, sales presentation, they see initial costs being cut. But not extrapolated, let's say over five years when we're trying to integrate our other systems input, et cetera. What was sort of the time frame of the cost change that you had in the previous graph? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I think, I think what you're getting at is, um, there's a, a, a potential gotcha with a cloud model that is if you're utilizing a cloud service for a long period of time that you, your costs can essentially go to the point where it costs more than the previous? Um, just un, unforeseen costs during the initial sort of sales cycle, meaning if we're going to be, you know, um, using at a web service or an API level, integrating our products with those, <coughs> et cetera, or maybe there's... Um, Maybe there's some, some uh, vendor management costs that weren't thought about in the first place, troubleshooting our system versus whatever's going on on the other side. Mm -hmm. you know. uh, these are things that we have a hard time convincing people that they exist. Um, and having a five-year model tends to work better. Oh, okay. So I see what you're saying. So, so those upfront costs you're amortizing over the life of the the bo the model so that it becomes a use you know it's kind of flattens out the curve if you will. You're changing someone from renting a software to renting it, for example, mm -hmm. right? So rent may seem cheaper up front, but then over a long period of time, you've also got new resources, uh, you know, invested that right. didn't take into account. So I w what I wouldn't recommend doing is 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 what I just described, which is saying, okay, we have these upfront costs to make the transition. Whatever they are, this is what we've estimated them to be. And I wouldn't recommend building those into your operational tr future state cost model because cause ultimately they're going to compare that to what they could get somewhere else. And if you're adding those costs in, then you're setting yourself up to fail from that vantage point. So you need to have, an you need to have another bucket. Treat it like a project, right? You know, like the old capital investment approach, right? Which is this is how much it's going to cost to transition. W that much money is what we're, we're budgeting for. And as you know, with PMP processes, you, you look at the risk associated with each one of those cost components and you, you, know, you, you call it a management reserve or whatever. You build in a little bit just to make sure there's, you know, this one is high risk, so it might cost a little more. So we're going you know, to build that into the factor, those sorts of things. But also on that model, there, um, I mean, at, at the beginning, you probably are just transitioning only some of the process that you're testing them out or whatever. Eventually, you move them all in. Is the cost later on increases or increases for transitioning all these new processes uh -huh. or applications? Or well, it, it depends on the characteristics of the process. In our case, what we're talking about is economies of scale, right? So, so we had a model, a financial model, which looked at the parameters of, okay, now we have this infrastructure, we built this cloud infrastructure for these services. And as we build in, bring in more services, how is that infrastructure going to be distributed to the new services? And at what point do we have to make a scale increase, a step increase in the overall infrastructure? And then at that point, how, how do we build that into a longer term cost model so that it's flat to our customers? And it's, I mean, it's a financial modeling challenge. <laughs> it's, it's true cost management, right? <clears throat> Sorry, you mentioned something earlier, uh, uh, trying to answer his initial question um, about uh, uh, increasing costs over time and situations where people are experiencing that. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, what I was getting at was, particularly at the time when we built these cloud services, people would look at the public cloud alternatives and they would look on it, look at it on a short time basis because those cloud services were designed to be transient by nature, which is you'd come in, you burst up, you use it for a short period of time, whatever, dev test, and then you'd pull out. But if you, if you, if you look at that cost over a longer period of time, it, it, it actually, the cloud was more expensive than its old fashioned legacy alternative. That has changed. I mean, the dynamic and the cost structure of that has changed quite a bit over the last three or four years. I don't want to make a um, misleading message. I think when you use the economies of scale later as it becomes adopted more, costs definitely go down. 
It's just there's that initial period um, that can be explained. Right. You said roll it into a project. That makes sense. And, and that's also a good a good point because of the the breadth of the services my organization was offering was that we we had scale, captive scale. You know what I'm saying? Is it because we had already reached a certain point of production capability with all these different services, so we were able to transition things over. Like I said, you know, phase one tends to be what's in IT's control. We were able to move a lot over, you know, without really having to go ask permission initially. And then, okay, now we've got a new project, you know, and then it becomes a, di a different effort. So you're able to achieve scale, you know, under your own, you know, management processes as opposed to now we're making an investment and we're asking our customers, however few, to carry the freight of that investment initially until we achieve scale. That's a different dynamic. No, couldn't do it, right? Couldn't do it. So in the period, our, our legislative requirements was on an annual basis, we had to fully recover our costs. So you could operate at a loss for a short period of time, but you basically, by the time it, the auditors came in and looked at your books, you had to be basically even. Great, great question, Steve. Yeah, that is a, a, very, a very good question in that, w without a doubt, it, there's changes that need to occur in the budgeting process, right? But it depends on the circumstance. So there were some cases where we had to negotiate with our customers in advance so that they, they had a budget estimate that they could go and include in their bucket, right? But that's kind of the old-fashioned way of doing budgeting, right? The new way of doing... <laughs> the new way of doing budgeting is, is completely from your operations expense perspective, right? Which is a, a little bit different of a ball game. But what we ended up doing was to treat it uniformly because we had to be as efficient as possible. Was we, our, our business managers, I went back to that role that didn't exist before we did this. Our business managers would work with our customers and they would get their approved budget manager. They don't care what the budget process was on the customer side. Doesn't care. We'll support it, but we don't care what it is. But when they come to us and say, I'm the budget manager and I've authorized this service up to a level of $30,000 this year, our business managers would go in and put that threshold into our business management tool set. And that was part of that process, right? I showed you those swim lanes. Part of that process was when the customer made the request, is there still budget authority to, add, you know, to draw down on? Does that make sense? It gets asked, see, that's what, that's, left in the year and my customers can't get anything because the budget has been drawn down by other people. That's, unless you some kind of governance process where it goes through a committee or something that says, this will now be charged for this. If we allow the customers to have total control over, I need to provision another server. You can't do that. Okay. <laughs> that's a government, and you're absolutely right. That is a governance issue, and it was one of our lessons learned. And I have a, an example of the, a software development project which did this, that, and this is, this is how we learned to put that governance, that control point into the workflow tool was, was that project, every software developer had the ability to go in and provision environments and to go spin up things. And so that software development project went way over budget, right? And then we looked at it and said, how did this happen? Ah, no brainer, right? We didn't have any controls. So then we went in and implemented that control, which is, it's okay, the project manager is the only person there who can, who can authorize spending on that project. And what they've done is they've looked at it and said, look, for the next month, my estimate is $12,000. $12, so I'm going to go in there and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approve you, business manager on your side, $12,000 threshold. That's, that's it. And then when things would bump up or get close to that, like 80% of that used, our business manager would go talk to that person and say, okay, you need to improve, you need to improve more budget. Then we got it more automated. 
So emails would automatically go out. You have 30 days to increase the budget or you will be stopped. You know, you have no more money you can spend. That sort of thing. Um, and it's going to mature over time. Yep. Uh, they, I actually have a different slide deck that goes into that specific lessons learned, but that's lessons learned of the governance model. I mean, that was basically it. Um, I, I don't know without this dialogue if you would get the value out of that slide, but I can, I can add it in to the deck and then repost it for, for everyone to get. I have a, I call it the pinwheel slide. It's these lessons learned that go around this wheel, and there's like 10 of them, and that's absolutely one of them, right? Sure. Just, let me make a note. What was the penalty if you're not meeting your SLA for four hours? Yeah, that. We've dealt with this before. We're going to make these SLAs for our customers, but if we don't meet it, I'm still a state employee. You know, you can't fire me. It's like, you know, and you're going to take away our money? What? Yeah, that's a good. That's a, a really good question. In that. On the, on the one hand, I, I, I could brush it off and say, well, we never missed our four-hour SLA. However, <laughs> the real answer you want is what, and it goes back to that HR structure I was talking about, was that we went back on our, in our organization and we basically restructured our performance plans for all of our staff that were involved in the cloud service operationally, right, to include MBO type objectives. And those MBO type objectives were around meeting our service levels that were in their particular areas. So in other words, you could not get a perfect five on your performance evaluation if your team failed to perform to its SLA. You could still get a four something, you know, because we couldn't hold, you know, we couldn't hold the individual accountable for the team 100%, right? We you know, had to balance out individual performance with team performance and so on and so forth. But we built it into the perform annual performance plans for the staff. Yeah, and we can't give them a bonus. We well, we didn't, yeah, we didn't really have bonuses for the most part. In private industry, you, I get my SLAs 100% of the time, great customer service. I walk away with another $10,000 check in December. And, uh, the public sector, we don't have that ability. I can't cut my staff's pay if they don't meet the SLA. I can write them up, and over a couple years, probably take some time. That means they do it consistently. So how do we, you know, because we've gone through this SLA thing, and what I've come down to is, yeah, it's going to affect our performance metrics. Again, there's, there's nothing that you can do to these folks if they don't need it other than take some kind of adverse action. Right, true, true there's point. Not, I mean, you, there's not a, there's not a carrot out there. You, you don't necessarily have that capability, but the good news is now compared to then, there's so much more capability that's in the tool set itself. We call it policy-driven automation, was that you define the policies at the cloud level that say this is the service level for this cloud that this customer is buying for, and the, and the software, the management software, manages to that service level. It does, it's not always 100%. I mean, if the, data, if the data center goes down, goes dark, and you lose all your power, it's still going to you know, necessarily have a problem, right? But th there's a lot more capability that's built into the software. As a result, but you can't control the HR structures. I mean, you you got to work within what what you got. So, uh, when you talk about uh, initially going with a lamp stack, mm -hmm. um, and you, when did you expand past that? Uh, oh, that's a good question because I don't think um, I don't think we actually did by the time I left. Right. So, um, the project timeline that I described there was 18 months start to finish for all of those capabilities that were built, 18 months. And so the initial capability we built was the LAMP stack for that particular PaaS environment. But what we learned by doing that was that PaaS was, I mean, we're looking four, four years ago, five years ago now, PaaS was very unknown at that particular point in time. Customers were much more interested in the infrastructure piece and the software piece. Right? They wanted to come in and get software services almost right away, and they wanted to use infrastructure for whatever it is they wanted to use it for. PaaS was much less in demand, so we kind of you know, put it on the back burner for a while because there just wasn't that, demand, that much demand for it. And uh, a lot of times in, in state government, we'll uh, put out a, a request for proposal for a solution. Um, did you 
did your did you or your customers <laughs> put out RFPs that specified this is the platform you're going to be running on? All right, so to a couple of different things. One was uh, we might have used some RFPs to acquire the right resources in the in industry to build it, right? Um, but then our customers, they might have issued RFPs that we responded to in order to win their business in the cloud, right? So there was kind of two different perspectives on that. No, no, the customer needs some business function and so looks for a vendor who can create or port software to meet their specific demands, mm -hmm. to be satisfied that business function. Mm -hmm. Did you take steps so that when your customer went out and talked to his systems integrator, the result would be something that could run smoothly on your infrastructure? Yeah, that was the intent. How did you do that? <laughs> I, I don't know if I can, uh, if I can go into all that now in the minute that I have left, but we can, we, we could, we, <laughs> and I am being told, and I did not get to my, my second example, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you one thing um, from the second example that you might be interested in is um, that, that they tallied, okay, so their business case was a, a hybrid cloud. So they built a private cloud at the Department of Energy, and then they moved it to all the different labs and connected them together. So what their, their value proposition was, they got 30 minute response time on the creating of a virtual machine. So that's their, that was their commitment. They saved $2 million a year in data center costs. And they got to the point where they now save 1.5 million kilowatt hours per year in energy consumption reduction. So their business case was a speed for their customers, cost savings of $2 million a year, and energy because it's the Department of Energy, right? As you can think about it, their business case, they needed to be able to show energy consumption reduction. So they kind of built that into their piece. I do apologize for not being able to get into the entire piece, but it was great questions and good dialogue. And I, I appreciate the fact that you were engaged. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. All, all of the business cases that I mentioned have total yeah. cost of ownership estimates, but you have to guess how long is it going to be right, in right. production, usually five years. And Thank you. Good questions. I appreciate it. It's available on the internet where they're going to put all this stuff. Yeah, it is available. Exactly. Okay.